Uh, hopefully, uh, at least most of you had some interaction with Dan. Uh, he came here in 1981, uh, passed away, unfortunately, in 2007. He was really instrumental in terms of uh, formulating critical care practices, uh, not just here, but on a global uh, level. I mean, Dan uh, was really one of the innovators in terms of uh, developing our understanding of acute lung injury. He was really the first person to use PET imaging in terms of evaluating patients who are critically ill, as well as non-critically ill patients in terms of animal models, and uh, was really one of the first people to actually give endotoxin, endobronchiolite to individuals. I can remember him doing that and uh, talking about it and uh, hoping that the patients would not suffer from that or the volunteers. But he held a number of very important positions here at the university. Um, he really published uh, some of the most important papers early on in terms of the better understanding of the physiology of acute lung injury. And so with that, you know, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Robert Balk here. Uh, it's important to know that you know, Dr. Balk was a friend of Dan's. He knew him. He worked on a number of committees with him as well. Dr. Bach, uh, and I urge you to take a look at the handout just to go through his background. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. But really one of the innovative thinkers in terms of formulating our uh, paradigm for sepsis as a syndrome and has published a number of important papers in that area. He's also served uh, as the director of the Pulmonary Critical Care Division for a long period of time up at Rush uh, University Medical Center and has held a number of important positions and has received a number of important awards from the Society of Critical Care Medicine as well as being in the Hall of Fame for the uh, American Association for Respiratory Care. So with that, we're very fortunate to have Dr. Bach uh, here and with that, I'm gonna let him give us uh, his presentation on sepsis today. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. <clears throat> Thanks, Marin, for that kind introduction. And it truly is an honor to be here and be able to talk a little bit about Dan Schuster and to meet with a number of folks who I know over here and actually spend a little time to go over what I will call sepsis struggles. So it, it's going to be a sort of whirlwind tour going back in time a little bit into what happens with our taking care of septic patients and show you that it isn't all just an easy road that we travel. I have to show you this slide, I think, for disclosures. More importantly, here are some disclosures, and I will tell you that even though I have had some research experience and consultancy with other companies, I don't think it's gonna bias my presentation today. I need to tell you I'm not a member of the Surviving Sepsis Campaign, if you've read their guidelines, but. I was part of the sepsis one definition, sepsis two definitions, and if you're in the CIRSI, um, critical illness related corticosteroid insufficiency, I've been part of that definitions and recommendations, and we'll share with you some of those definitions that are coming out. Well, but we're here to actually talk about Dan Schuster, and he was a phenomenal person um, who we lost way too early. He was a great educator, researcher, clinician, and leader, as you've heard about here. And I had the opportunity to work with him in a number of clinical research trials where we had a clinical evaluation committee, that's CEC, where for clinical trials in sepsis, this is the committee that adjudicates whether the patients were correctly admitted with a sepsis definition, whether they got appropriate early antibiotics, got appropriate source control, whether any adverse events are attributed to the test article, and whether the outcome can be adjudicated to they got better with the test article, worse with the test article, they died of sepsis and the like. But Dan was also a phenomenal table tennis player. And when we would take breaks, he'd challenge us all to ping pong, table tennis, but uh, he'd always win. And I think he unfortunately died before this new game called pickleball came out, because he'd, he'd have certainly been taking that to mastership levels. So what I'd like to do today is to define sepsis and septic shock, review some resuscitation strategies and targets for sepsis and septic shock. I'm going to go a little bit cautiously and talk about antibiotics with Dr. Kalif here, but talk about antibiotic therapy and antibiotic stewardship, and talk about the economic impact of sepsis. 
And let's start with just a, a little bit on sepsis. I know we're all very aware of it. We've all lived through COVID, which I think was a very septic as well as an ARDS type picture. And it's interesting that if you look at the CDC top 10 causes of death in the United States, prior to 2020, sepsis was always in the top 10. And in 2020, it fell to 11. But number three was COVID deaths. And number nine was death from influenza and pneumonia. And I would expect that if you died of COVID, influenza, or pneumonia, you were probably septic. So I, I think we, we need to realign how we code things. But it's estimated we have about 1.7 million episodes of sepsis each year in the US. Part of it depends on what our definition is that we're going to use to define it. One of three hospital deaths is probably related to sepsis. And this excess mortality is sort of hard to understand because we all have an increased awareness of sepsis. We have bundles, guidelines, best practices. You probably have a smart app on your electronic medical record that will tell you how to manage sepsis. If you read the 2021 update in Surviving Sepsis Campaign Guidelines, 93 recommendations, 80 pages, huge amount of information there, yet the mortality is still up there. It's improving, but it's still inappropriately high. It's very expensive to take care of septic patients. And unfortunately, even when we get the patient to survive, there's still a lot of adverse sequela, increased morbidity, and subsequent increased mortality that we have to deal with. So what is sepsis? And if we try to define it, it depends on what context we're talking about. Are we talking about a diagnosis we use for rounds? Are we talking about diagnosis we use for research? Are we talking about a billing diagnosis? Or some of these administrative diagnoses which the various regulatory agencies are now holding us to. And through the years, we've had a variety of different diagnoses. <clears throat> Prior to 1980, sepsis was equatable with bacteremia or with something called septicemia. In the 80s, we used this term sepsis syndrome, which I'm not sure is a wrong move these days because the heterogeneity of what we see in septic patients is more like what we see in ARDS, which we classify as a syndrome, and we say we need to know the phenotype to help us know how are we best treated? But sepsis we all lump into, it's an infection causing this body reaction, and we treat it all pretty much the same, and I'm not sure that is the way to actually go. But we have lots of definitions, and unfortunately, what we have is a syndrome that starts off with a lot of common manifestations. We all see it, fever, tachycardia, tachypnea or hyperventilation, white cell abnormalities, alterations in mental status, maybe coagulation abnormalities. And this gave rise to something that was called the systemic inflammatory response syndrome or the SIRS definition. And the SIRS definition lasted about 24, 25 years before people came out and said, hey, you know what? This SIRS definition which is supposed to be very sensitive and pick up anyone that could have infection causing a systemic reaction that we could say is sepsis. It's not as good as you think it is. The, <clears throat> the group of investigators in Australia and New Zealand actually found that one out of every eight patients that they diagnosed with sepsis actually did not manifest any of the surge criteria, but yet still had similar outcomes, similar mortality rate, and SIRS, which was designed to aid clinical trial enrollment, and I'll emphasize that in a few slides to come, actually was then abandoned, and we came up with a new definition, which we're gonna call sepsis three. And now we're gonna define sepsis as a life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to an infection. And how are we gonna recognize this organ dysfunction? We're gonna use the SOFA score. Now, I hate to ask questions. Do you all use the SOFA score on 
on rounds to diagnose organ dysfunction. I can tell you at my center, we don't. In fact, if I ask my residents on rounds, they don't know what I'm talking about. And I actually think the SOFA score is a bit outdated, especially when you look at the cardiovascular assessment because nobody's using dopamine anymore. So I, I think we probably still need a better definition. But I do like the sepsis three definition of septic shock. And that is when we define sepsis, so this dysregulated response with organ dysfunction to an infection, but now we've got not only hypotension, but hypotension that requires vasopressors in order to maintain a map of 65 or greater, and we have an elevation in serum lactate. And we know that this constellation of features is associated with a reasonable mortality rate of usually 40% or more. So that is important to identify. Now, unfortunately, depending on the definition, it's, if you're trying to say what is the incidence of sepsis, it gives you a number between five and 700 per every 100,000 people, because what definition are you using? And this used the definition of the SIRS criteria. So this is before 2015, when the Australian New Zealand report came out, and before sepsis three came out in 2016. But that number on a global level would equate to about 32 million episodes of sepsis. And this is way before COVID and way before any of the other uh, big new uh, occurrences of infection like influenza and the like. And that could equate to 5.3 million deaths per year. Now, interesting, if we look at what we do in the US, and look at our data on sepsis, we can see that our sepsis diagnoses are going up every year, and this is going from 2009 to 2014. Fortunately, our hospital mortality seems to be going down, but this equated to where we got the 1.7 million episodes of adults hospitalized with sepsis every year, and 270,000 deaths in 2014. Now, what I thought is very interesting is that us physicians were a little slower to code these sepsis, because if we look at the surveillance definition of sepsis, it was going up rapidly. But physicians weren't really putting sepsis codes in till the payers started to reimburse at a higher rate for sepsis. And look how we caught up. We, we gradually caught up, and fortunately, the mortality rate, whether with the surveillance definition <clears throat> or ICD-9 definition, mortality rate is going down. You, you can almost pick up that the ICD-9 definition has a lower mortality rate because not only did we catch up in our diagnosis of sepsis, we probably overcoded. And a lot of people who weren't septic, we called septic, and they did very well because they truly were not having sepsis. As far as organisms causing sepsis, we've seen a change. <clears throat> when Marin and I were first, <clears throat> sorry, when Marin and I were first practicing, we had a lot of gram-positive organisms causing sepsis back in the late 80s, early 90s. And as time has gone on, we've seen that the gram-negative organisms have made a resurgence and are now the most common cause of sepsis when we can define an organism. We fortunately have seen that mortality through all the organisms, whether it's fungal, anaerobic, gram-negative, gram-positive, is going down. But the big ones that have the highest mortality seem to be related to MRSA and anaerobic organisms. But it also depends where is your infection. If you have a urinary tract infection, the expected mortality is pretty low. Whereas if you have intra-abdominal catastrophes with a lot of sepsis, you're dealing with a higher expected mortality rate. And the pneumonia happens to be kind of in the middle. It's also important, since we're working in the ICU, to avoid ICU-acquired infection, because you can see the great increase in expected mortality with ICU-acquired versus non ICU patients who don't acquire an ICU infection. And the longer you're in the ICU, the more likely you may get a infection. So we have a lot of opportunities in our sepsis management. 
We need some early diagnostic strategies in order to improve outcome. We'd like to improve the quality of care and resource utilization, and this may come with earlier and accurate diagnosis. We want to have strategies to optimize our resuscitation and maintain organ function, prevent multi-organ failure. We'd love to decrease the cost, and especially the long-term management costs. We need to do better with antibiotic stewardship and avoid creating more multidrug resistant organisms. And some of us are driven to meet administrative and governmental metrics of care. So the Surviving Sepsis Campaign in 2021 came out and said, in a strong recommendation, we need to have some sort of performance improvement program to help us identify sepsis. And they recommend using either SIRS criteria, the NEWS, the MUSE, there's a NEWS2 criteria, um, but they're against using the QSOFA. And patients with suspected sepsis should have a blood lactate sampled. So what are some early detection strategies? Well, there's a ton of them that are out there and more coming every day. We have huge electronic databases. We can do data mining. We can use those early warning systems. I've been involved in a number of biomarker studies, anywhere from procalcitonin to pancreatic stone protein to something called a septicite rapid. And suffice it to say, none of them are sufficient at this point in time, either alone or in combination, to be able to say, we have now defined sepsis, and we're not missing anything. So I think more is to come. Now I'm going to digress and send us back in a time machine to 1991. Dr. Schuster's in his lab, and so are everybody else. And, and we have, as Marin told you, Dan had endotoxin. Well, in the lab, we could take endotoxin and inject it into an animal or into cells, or we could use TNF, or we can create infection by ligating the cecum and making some perforations so we know when sepsis potentially happens or infection happens. And then we can look at this roadmap and say, all right, we've injected this insider. The macrophages are going to respond and produce all these cytokines. We have metabolites of arachidonic acid. We're activating the coag system, the complement system. And from there, oh, thank you. And we've got the neutrophils. And we can say, we've created sepsis. Not only that, we can now block it, because we have great new drugs that we can sit here, and we have TNF blockers, we have anti-endotoxins, and we can do all these different clinical trials to basically cure sepsis. And I'm going to review a few of these that Dan and I worked on together. Here's an exciting one, interleukin-1 receptor antagonist. You create sepsis, you identify patients, we use that sepsis... Uh, syndrome definition that led to SIRS. And look at this nice dose response curve of reduction in mortality. The more we gave, the better they did. So it went from phase two to phase three, three B, and three other trials failed to show improvement. Unfortunately, this drug is now used very nicely in rheumatology, but it is not an antisepsis drug. If we go to TNF, and we say, we can block it with a TNF receptor blocker. And conduct a trial using two doses of a TNF receptor blocker. And you see nicely in a phase two trial that if they have septic shock, it had better survival compared to placebo. They weren't in shock, didn't seem to work. So you create another study, conduct it, in patients only in shock, and you find out that the monoclonal antibody against TNF didn't do any better than placebo. So we're striking out a lot. We're using lots of patients, billions of dollars. We tried new strategies. Let's use a TNF receptor fusion protein. And unfortunately here, the more you gave, the worse the outcome was. And then you have to go back in and look at some science and say, why is that? And it turns out we, we don't know when the actual onset of sepsis really happens. When was the insult with endotoxin or, or the bacterial product? And 
all of these mediators come out, but by the time we recognize it and want to respond, is it too late? And here's some work from Scotland where they actually showed that at the time that they identified people with sepsis, that two-thirds of them actually had circulating endotoxin in their body, 14% had TNF, which comes out very early and then goes away. IL-1 was out there in about a third of the patients. But if you look at the TNF receptor blocker, that the concentration, even at early sepsis, was already 30 to 100,000 times the amount that is there in the non-septic patient. And giving more of a TNF blocker actually doesn't make much sense if they've already got their own response. So this is a tribute to my mentor, Roger Bone, who did a lot of work in trying to put these together, put these trials together, and, and came up with the acronym for SIRS, Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome. And he, he loved acronyms, so he talked about there's also a compensatory anti-inflammatory response syndrome, or CARS, and then if you put it all together, you get MARS for a mixed antagonist response syndrome. And if all this is leading to overload of acronyms, we come up with chaos, where now you have cardiovascular compromise, you try to get homeostasis, you will have some apoptosis, which can lead to organ dysfunction, and then eventually you get to suppression of the immune system, and this is where the CARS predominates. And we've actually now learned that sepsis is extremely complex, and it varies, and, and there's all sorts of different potential mediators and different types of inflammatory processes going on that involve the humoral, cellular, neural immune mechanisms. And it is extremely complex. And even work from right here in your pathology depart department and immunology department by Dr. Hotchkiss and, and Boomer showed that immune effector cells in the spleen we're actually demonstrating that sepsis patients who died were actually immunosuppressed as opposed to being in this pro-inflammatory, systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And in actuality, what we probably see in sepsis are different phenotypes, where you have the phenotype where early pro-inflammatory responses happen, and they either get better or they die. You have the patients who have the pro-inflammatory response, anti-inflammatory response, and then they recover. Or those who keep anti-inflammatory and are more immunodepressed actually get secondary infections, reactivation of viruses. And unfortunately, some of us deal with the, the pro-inflammatory, anti-inflammatory, pro-inflammatory, and the long hospital stay with all sorts of, what we'll say, parameters of am I treating infection or am I overly suppressed? So we're going to now spend the t rest of the time talking about sepsis management. And we're going to talk about the use of appropriate early antibiotics and source control, giving adequate fluid resuscitation, maintaining and achieving hemodynamic stability, I'm not going to get into supporting oxygenation and ventilation as necessary or tissue oxygen delivery. And of course, we always want to prevent complications of critical illness. So again, we're going to go back to 2000, 2001, where Manny Rivers sort of revolutionized our thinking of how do we approach resuscitation. And before then, the standard approach was we would give fluid in patients who were hypotensive with sepsis and try to get a CVP, which many of you probably aren't even looking at anymore, central venous pressure, trying to get an 8 to 12 millimeters of mercury CVP, trying to maintain the MAP above 65, and trying to get urine to come out of the patient. And in those days, everybody had a Foley catheter, which we don't put in anymore. And then Manny Rivers said, let's take these septic patients. I'm going to put them in a separate area of my, of my emergency room, and I'm going to make a little ICU out of it. And not only am I going to be achieving these goals, but I'm going to look at, on that CVP catheter, central venous oxygen saturation. And if I'm not hitting my targets, and I see the central venous oxygen saturation is lower than 70, I'm going to look at what their hemoglobin is. And if it's below 10, 
or a hematocrit less than 30, I'm going to give them hemoglobin. And if their stats are low, I may even go ahead and intubate them. And if I'm still having trouble getting my central venous oxygen saturation above 70, I'm going to, instead of just dopamine, I'm going to add dobutamine. And he showed a dramatic improvement in hospital survival and decrease in organ dysfunction. And here was his data, and you can see this was a great thing. However, subsequent trials as time went on, and you get to the mid-2010, so 2014, 2015, we have the ARISE trial, the PROMISE trial, the PROCESS trial, and we're seeing that standard therapy does as well as what we call early goal-directed therapy at getting patients to survive their septic insult. And looking at 90-day mortality, current goal-directed therapy is what we all do. And we're all using goals. And it may not be central venous pressure. It may just be you're going for a map of over 65. And you may or may not be looking at urine output if you don't put Foley's in there. But I bet you're measuring lactate because the government mandates that we now measure lactate. And it's not, <clears throat> not just what is the lactate, it's can you clear the lactate. So you'd like to have an early lactate within the first three hours and show that if you look at it two to four hours later, is it reducing by about 20%? And you'd like to then see that it goes back to normal. And lactate clearance is a great way to show that you are actually improving the physiology of sepsis. And you can see if the lactate stays high, especially above four millimoles, and they're still hypotensive, you have a high mortality rate, but the mortality rate reduces to about 30% if you have cleared the lactate and are treating the hypotension. Now, some of you may not be able to send off lactates every couple hours. So you can look at, let's look at capillary refill. Everybody can do that. We probably don't all do it correctly, but if we could get capillary refill times less than two to three seconds, maybe that's a good marker that we are adequately resuscitating our patient. And we're giving fluid, and the question is, how much and to who do we give fluid? And and when, and where, and how. And the Surviving Sepsis Campaign has answered that for you and said, we're going to give 30 mils per kilogram of fluid to the patient as soon as you identify them. So as soon as they're hypotensive, and maybe should we give it to everyone, what kind of fluid? Should we give crystalloid? Should we give balanced crystalloid, like lactated ringers or plasma light? We should give it soon because the mandates say you got three hours to get your fluid in. So you should start it in the emergency department, or you can wait to the ICU, but you're behind the ball there. And bolus is better than a slow, prolonged infusion. But there's a lot of questions still to be asked. Is, is actually, is that required for everyone? Does one volume really work for everyone? What about my patient with heart failure? What about my renal failure patient who does not make urine. And I know from my reading of the ARDS literature, the ARDS network clearly showed that too much fluid is bad and will lead to longer length of stay and more organ dysfunction. So maybe fluid isn't the best for everyone, or certainly not everyone should be approached the same way. Now, I think if you're into systematic reviews and meta-analysis, there probably is no area in medicine that has had more than fluid resuscitation. And it dates all the way back to the early 2000s, where you're looking at, should we give albumin versus saline, now versus balanced crystalloid versus starches versus gel gelatins? And balanced crystalloid and albumin appear equally beneficial in this systematic review. But there's always been this concern that too much normal saline, besides causing a hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis that might make your acid-base picture worse, that it may predispose your patient to acute renal failure. So a number of trials looked at, is saline worse or better than just buffered saline? Here's the split trial 
where there was no difference in the need for renal replacement therapy between those two therapies. How about the Vanderbilt trial? This is a large trial where one month they used lactated ringers in the ER and it followed to the ICU. Next month they used normal saline and they looked at the primary outcome being a major adverse kidney event or mortality. And there's a suggestion, it was significant, that using a lactated ringers approach rather than normal saline was beneficial in the critically ill patient who needed resuscitation. Unfortunately, that isn't the end of the answer. I don't know what you guys use here, but the Australian New Zealand Critical Care Group, which does a lot of great studies, they actually looked at, can we compare normal saline resuscitation to a balanced electrolyte solution resuscitation and look at survival and all of the important goals, including renal replacement, sepsis, and they found no difference. Now, the real issue here is, can you actually do the study? Because certain patients who get certain drugs, it has to be a normal saline, whether they're in the balanced electrolyte solution or not. Certain patients are going to get D5W, because that's how those drugs are given. And it is extremely hard to control something like this, and very hard to do this on a blinded basis. So I don't know that we have the answer, but I think rather than concentrate so much on we're going to flood them with all this fluid, let's stop flooding people and go to more restrictive IV fluid resuscitation and maybe starting the patients on earlier vasopressors. And this is a movement that is just starting to take place now. And this is an interesting study because if you look back to Manny Rivers and his early resuscitation, his claim that what was the big difference is he was given five liters of fluid within the first six hours. That's a lot of fluid. And if we look at the 30 mils per kilogram of the normal 70 kilogram person, that's a couple liters of fluid. And now we're going to look at randomizing patients to get less than 60 mils per kilogram of IV fluid in the first 72 hours versus usual care. And the usual care, it turned out, actually turned out to be 61 mils of fluid per kilogram. But the restricted group was giving 47 mils per kilogram of fluid in the first 72 hours. This isn't in the first three hours or whatever. And the 30-day mortality was actually about the same. So you can say, well, it doesn't matter how much fluid. Or you could conclude, you know what, maybe we don't need to use so much fluid. We can resuscitate with a little less fluid, like the ARDS people were trying to manage, and end up with similar survival curves and no increase in new organ failures, no change in length of stay or adverse events. And in fact, the NIH uh, pedal network did the CLOVERS trial, and they showed that a restrictive strategy, which used less fluid and earlier vasopressors, did equally well to a more liberal strategy, where you gave more fluid, but you used less vasopressors. So maybe that's where the pendulum needs to start swinging. Now we're going to talk a little bit about resuscitation with vasopressors. It was dopamine back when Manny Rivers was doing his work. And now we've learned that, unfortunately, dopamine causes a lot of arrhythmias. And it is not renal protective. So norepinephrine, which when I was training, it was called levofed, and it was called leave them dead. We shunned away from it. But now it is our primary vasopressor. And this is a very good study that is really the only one I've seen which is double blind, where they compared epinephrine and a placebo to the standard at the time was norepinephrine, and if they needed some inotropic support, dobutamine. And this was done in France by Delali Anon. And they actually showed in 90-day survival curves that there was no difference between these two vasopressor and inotropic resuscitation strategies. The reason I want to bring it out, though, is the difference that you might see early on 
is the group that got epinephrine had a lower pH and a higher lactate. So if you're resuscitating with epinephrine and you're using lactate as one of your goals of adequate resuscitation, you might expect that you're going to have more trouble clearing your lactate. So pay attention to that. There's also concern, is the map of 65 the right map for everyone? If people are always hypertensive and you manage them with a lower map, might that lead to more, I'll say, adverse outcomes? So there was a nice study looking at creating a strategy where you kept the map between 80 and 85 versus keeping the map between 65 and 75. And it turns out that the survival curves were the same. Unfortunately, if you look at patients who are always hypertensive, who are managed with a lower MAP, they have an increased risk for renal replacement therapy. So maybe a bigger renal hit. And if you look at people who aren't actually hypertensive all the time, and you run them at a higher MAP, they actually have more episodes of AFib. So maybe you should individualize what is the best way to take care of your patients. Now, our surviving sepsis campaign has suggested that if norepinephrine is not adequate to raise your MAP, you should go ahead and start a second line vasopressor, and that would be suggested to be vasopressin. There have been three large clinical trials, the VAST, the VANISH, and the VANCS II trial, to look at using vasopressin as a primary vasopressor and then as an add-on. And unfortunately, inconsistency in these results. And unfortunately, they you know, don't really give us a lot of advice for how to use the vasopressin. We, we know we're going to do fixed dose at 0.03 or 0.04 units per minute. But what we don't know is, when should we start the vasopressin when we're on norepinephrine? So this is a nice recent review paper that came out where they suggest starting the vasopressin when your norepinephrine dose is 0.25 to 0.5 micrograms per kilogram per minute. And this may help you avoid going way high on your vasopressin. Some of the findings from like the VANISH and the VANK trial showed that if you wait to start your vasopressin till the norepinephrine dose is very high, you have worse outcome, which sort of makes sense. If somebody's failing to the point that they're on super high doses of norepinephrine, they're not going to do well. So from the campaign, it says initiate your vasopressors early. Do not wait for an arterial line or even a central venous catheter. You can start them through an adequately placed peripheral catheter. Norepinephrine is your preferred initial vasopressor, followed by vasopressin. You can add epinephrine if you need an inotrope, or you can go right with dobutamine if you find that their ejection fraction is low. If you're doing an echo and you say that they have poor cardiac contractility, add an inotrope like dobutamine. And the MAP goal of greater than or equal to 65 may not be the right goal for everybody. You might want to personalize it. We're going to move into antibiotic therapy for a brief time here and realize that a lot of our antibiotic prescribing is actually unnecessary. We are giving antibiotics for fungal infections, for viral infections, and we don't always know that there truly is a bacterial infection. And part of it isn't our fault. We don't get culture results back very timely. We get misleading results sometimes from sputum cultures, urine cultures, that we have to figure out what's a real pathogen versus a contaminant. So we need to have faster, more accurate indicators of infection. And this will help us improve our antibiotic stewardship. We know that the guidelines from surviving sepsis urge us to start our antibiotic within one hour. In those patients who have septic shock, and do not delay. If, even if you're not able to get your cultures, get those antibiotics in as soon as possible. However, if you're not sure the patient truly is septic and they're not hypotensive, you have about three hours to actually do a workup, investigate, 
see what's going on, see if, if there really is an infection or a site of infection, to actually think about what would be the cause of the infection and to actually then give a more directed antibiotic approach to those people. And you would start with broad spectrum coverage. You would cover the likely organisms with the knowledge of what goes on in your institution. Hopefully know your actual unit's antibiogram so you know what's likely going to work. They do not want you to rely on a procalcitonin elevation or CRP elevation in order to make that decision. Although you might use procalcitonin to help you with your stewardship decisions about how long to treat. That, that is still up in the air to decide. But it's important to know PK and PD, uh, pharmacodynamic data for your patient so you can give the right therapy. And as you get data to help you tailor and your patients then improve and then de-escalate your antibiotic therapy so that you can judiciously use your antibiotics. Now, the data that is really driving that one hour time to get your antibiotics in is a non-Kumars data, and our institution was part of this, and admittedly, we had some delays, and we took care of that by putting antibiotics in the PIXIS system, in the ER, and in the ICU, so that if you want to give early antibiotics, it's not just when you write the order, it's when the antibiotics are actually administered to the patients. That's where that hour, because every hour of delay can lead to a 7.6% decrease in survival for that patient. So the clock is running. We have these golden minutes, maybe golden hour, in septic shock to decide, am I going to give antibiotics? Which ones? And can I get them actually into the patient? Because then I can improve the patient's outcome, decrease the development of shock if they're not in shock, and meet quality metrics, which I keep harping on. However, if we over-prescribe our antibiotics and do inappropriate use, we run the risk of increasing antibiotic resistance, creating more multidrug resistant organisms, giving our patients antibiotic-associated diarrhea, and other complications. The problem is nobody's going to conduct a trial to say, let's give early antibiotics to this person, and we're going to wait a day to do antibiotics for this patient. We may delay a little bit, and a little bit may be up to three hours, because we have guidelines that say we got to get those antibiotics in those three hours. So is anybody going to study that? Well, it turns out the University of Virginia SICU did that, and they did a kind of quasi before and after experimental study where in the first year they said, we're just going to give antibiotics when somebody thinks there could be an infection and look at outcome. And the second year they said, you know, if we're not sure, we're going to carefully think about this. We're going to send off some studies. We're going to get some gram stains of, of, of different uh, specimens like urine or sputum, and we're going to make a more knowledgeable decision. And the interesting finding is with this conservative approach, they actually decreased all-cause mortality from 27 to 13 percent. They decreased the duration of antibiotic therapy from 17.7 days to 12.5 days, and they gave more initially appropriate antibiotic therapy. So, I'm saying thinking things through is important. And there have been a number of meta-analyses on antibiotics within the first hour. And here you can see mortality. And the, the Kumar data really stands out here. But a number of other studies were really sort of straddling the line of identity. And if you go to three hours, of administering antibiotics and look at mortality. Again, you're straddling the line of identity. And I, I think you know the data to say you have to do it within one hour isn't nearly as strong as the guidelines suggest it is. So I'm not saying delay antibiotics. I'm saying think about antibiotics. And, and there's unfortunately a lot to think about. You know, It's not just the time to infusion. It's the order. 
<laughs> you know what? If you if you don't know if it's gram positive, gram negative, so you're doing your vancomycin and your peptazo, and it turns out it's a gram negative infection, but you chose vancomycin to be the first antibiotic, you've then delayed the peptazo until at least at our center, they, they get the vanc in, then they do the peptazo. So what's the order of infusion? And how do you want an infusion? You want to give a bolus. You want to give a prolonged infusion. You want a continuous infusion. And then dosing needs to be adjusted with pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, because we know we have young people with augmented renal clearance who are going to just pee out a bunch of antibiotics. We know sometimes we've been overzealous with our Fluid resuscitation, the volume of distribution is way out of whack. And, and we use a lot of renal replacement therapy. We put people on ECMO and other types of interventions that are going to impact the outcome and success of our antibiotic therapy. So we're going to move from antibiotics to steroids and tackle controversy here. So steroids are potentially beneficial in inflammatory and in immunologic disorders. And we know a number of infections, like meningitis, typhoid fever, pneumocystis, varicella, and we've just played the COVID game where steroids were a big benefit. When I started my career, I started my first clinical trial with early high-dose steroids. And high-dose was two grams of methylprednisolone every six hours for 48 hours. That's, that's a heck of a lot of, that's industrial strength steroids. And you'd say, why would anybody do that? Well, it was the package insert indication at that time was it was the treatment of septic shock because a guy named Bill Schumer at the North Chicago VA had done a prior retrospective and then prospective trial showing it improved mortality. So we were part of a study to see, and the VA cooperative did a similar study did it work? And early high-dose steroids didn't prevent shock development, didn't help reverse shock, and didn't improve survival. And in fact, if the patient had a creatinine over two, it actually caused more shock, less shock reversal, and higher mortality. So that got rid of that package insert indication. But steroids stepped coming back. It was like the treatment that would not die and kept coming back and coming back. And 37 randomized control trial later, we now have a meta-analysis with about 10,000 patients, and it suggests that there is a moderate, we'll call it mortality benefit at 28 days, moderate in hospital and ICU benefit to giving steroids, and this is more physiologic dose. This is your hydrocortisone at 50 milligrams every six hours and doing that for about five to seven days during the shock period. It'll improve the SOFA score, it'll help reverse shock, it'll decrease the time of shock, but there's a price to pay and that's hyperglycemia and hypernatremia. And looking at the meta-analysis, it, it's actually found as long as you're using reasonable dose hydrocortisone and it actually is seen with other steroid preparations. And it is actually irrespective of whether you have a group with a high mortality or low mortality. And you may say, so what should you do about steroids? So I'm going to give you, here's my suggestions. Use it for vasopressor-dependent septic shock. I would suggest going with hydrocortisone although recognize that the French are very big in adding fludrocortisone to the hydrocortisone, and we'll show you that they have mortality benefit that improves if you add the fludrocortisone. You need to recognize that this is vasopressor-dependent septic shock, or you suspect the patient has a high likelihood of adrenal insufficiency. Otherwise, if it's just sepsis, I would not use that. And what is the benefit? Well, it will help you decrease the duration of shock. I can't stand here and say it's going to help improve survival. There is some data. And how to give it either IV infusion every six hours or IV push. That is, um, and you can do continuous infusion. Now, I will tell you that just two days ago, 
the uh, CIRCE committee gave up the 2024 focused update on guidelines on the use of corticosteroids in sepsis, acute respiratory distress syndrome, and community-acquired pneumonia. And under sepsis, it's a strong recommendation not to give high-dose steroids. And there's a sort of suggestion that you can use the physiologic dose steroids for those with septic shock with the caveat that it may not improve survival, but it should improve shock reversal. Now, if you want to pull this up, it's online. You can also see there, there's recommendations, a conditional recommendation with moderate certainty for the use of steroids in acute respiratory distress syndrome, and a strong recommendation to use steroids for severe community-acquired pneumonia that ends up in your ICU. So I'll leave that to you. Now, some of you may remember about five years ago, right before COVID, there was a big uh, brouhaha that Paul Merrick and others had that using HET therapy, hydrocortisone, ascorbic acid, and thiamine was going to cure sepsis. And I have a neighbor, some of you may be old enough to remember Paul Harvey. He used to live around the corner from me, did a noon talk show on the radio where he always gave you the rest of the story. Um, so now there have been multiple trials that have concluded that there is no benefit in using HAT therapy or ascorbic acid therapy or thiamine therapy in sepsis. So do not treat uh, septic patients with that. And talking about pitfalls along the way, you know, we've, this has not been a smooth journey. We've learned that tight glucose control, while it looked great in an initial trial, actually was probably killing people when we did that to everybody in the ICU. And if we weren't killing, we were certainly killing brain cells by causing hypoglycemia. And some of you remember that wonder drug called drotrocogen alpha activated, or Zygris, which came out as the cure. That was activated protein C, the cure for sepsis. And unfortunately, that has now been taken off the market. So the good news is that our sepsis outcome we're seeing that the mortality rate is declining, that unfortunately we can't just clap our hands and high fives, that the people who are surviving sepsis we find have a worse health-related quality of life. They actually have increased mortality up to eight years after surviving sepsis. And that's as long as anybody's, I think, done a clinical trial to follow them. A lot of them have decreased cognitive abilities and you know, we, we have certain laws that are out there now. In Illinois, we have a law that tells us we have to educate people about sepsis. In New York, they actually mandate that they have to be giving their three-hour resuscitation bundle. And those of you who deal with uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services know that CMS has some guidelines, that there's a guideline for what you have to do within three hours and what you have to do within six hours for severe sepsis and septic shock. And this is a tough game to play, that you have to meet all the criteria or you don't get credit. You don't get partial credit or partial payment. Now, fortunately, they put off till 2026 before they're going to have the non-reimbursement component of this going in there. But you know how things are in, in medicine. Barnes-Jewish has a great reputation, but somebody's probably going to have a thing. How is their sepsis care? So they're going to rate you on your quality of care, your patient outcome, resource utilization, your reimbursement in revenue, your program directors may talk to you about, and then reputation and rankings all come into play. In New York, where they have the law, they, they actually monitor all the hospitals. So here's about 50,000 patients, 149 hospitals. 82.5% completed the three-hour bundle within the three hours, which is great. Most did it within 1.3 hours, so they were really learning. Reimbursement drives that. And you can see that as you get longer out from your bundle, the mortality goes up as far as following the bundle and the delay in antibiotics. Fluid didn't have that big an impact. Now, looking back in time, 2003 to 2007, at in-hospital mortality, it's gone down. What I want to show you is the people going home are about the same. 
what is really going up are the people going to skilled nursing facilities and LTACs. So we are shifting some of our hospital mortality out of the hospital to SNFs and LTAC. And back in 2007, the cost of sepsis care was about $24.3 billion. I have no idea what it is now. Now, for those of you who say, it doesn't matter what I do, you're probably right. Because you look at the people who die of sepsis and say, is it definitely preventable? And very few of those cases are definitely preventable. Most of these are destined to happen as their death. And the reason is, all of these underlying comorbid conditions that are people really dying of sepsis, or are they dying with sepsis, but with their underlying condition. But I will tell you, and this is the eight-year survival data, that post-discharge, the survival curve isn't a, a straight line across. You young people do much better as we age, especially as you get over age 50, 60, 70, it goes down. The, the more comorbidities you have, your survival goes down, the number of failing organs, number of survival go down. And even if you do survive, a lot of people have neurologic complications, whether it's ICU-acquired weakness and paresis, cognitive impairment, this dis-executive uh, syndrome where you can't go back to working like you used to be able to work, and just the poor quality of life. And people with sepsis, unfortunately, end up getting readmitted frequently. So the take-home message is, again, early diagnosis, identification of sepsis, early and effective antibiotics and source control, early effective, it's repetitive message, resuscitation, and hemodynamic management with judicious fluid replacement, use lung protective ventilatory support, use steroids for vasopressor-dependent sepsis, or if you think they're adrenally insufficient, prevent the complications of critical illness. Now, the road ahead, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't leave something to think about. I think we need to do more on early recognition to help us initiate therapy. It's time that we get precision treatment, so we should be able to use PCR technology to identify this is the pathogen, this is the antibiotic sensitivity, this is what's going on, and give directed therapy. And someday we need to talk about sepsis prevention. With that, let me thank you. I really appreciate being able to talk in the honor of Dr. Schuster. And let me show you these CME and MOC cords, codes. And thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Excellent question, Marin, and, and I think that's where we're going. We're seeing that in ARDS and, you know, the hyperinflammatory phenotype versus the hypoinflammatory, and I, that's why I, I go back to the old sepsis syndrome. The, to think sepsis is just a, a hodgepodge of all sorts of things that needs to be addressed as a specific phenotype, and I think then we're going to have some actual improvement in outcome. You know, it was tried. I, I have to tell you, I only showed you a smattering of the billions of dollars sent, spent on trials. The Humira, which we're all familiar with, was evaluated as an anti-TNF in sepsis, where they looked at IL-6 levels at the bedside to decide who to give it to. Unfortunately, it didn't work. But, uh, you know, maybe some other way to refine the phenotypes just as we're trying to do an ARDS, what will lead to a breakthrough here? Great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, your last slide about prevention, so um, I think it was October, November, the New England Journal published a study on substance use and long-term care, which showed simply by decolonization using chlorhexidines for their saving iodine for nasal um, passages. Yep. Well, it certainly could, especially in those people who are in various settings.
settings like nursing homes, LTACs, and whatnot. Um, whether we should all start doing chlorhexidine baths, I, I think that's a stretch. I think we should all brush our teeth because that seems to keep us from getting ventilator-associated pneumonia and hospital-acquired pneumonia. Um, it probably makes good sense anyway. But there probably are going to be vaccines. There are going to be better ways to you know, sort of deal with uh, some of the ways that we have people who are immunocompromised and what can they do. Maybe that's a population that could benefit from that. Or if they had recurrent, um, let's say, staph infections, you, know, you can treat their nose for staph. But I don't know that we'd get there. I don't know. Do you have a comment on that, Marin? You're m much more expert on infection. ICU patients, there are some studies that have suggested that it may be beneficial, but not everyone has adapted that. I mean, we have in the past. So, yeah. yeah, we do chlorhexidine baths on our ICU patients, but not everybody. And I don't know if it's cost effective, number one, for everybody. And number two, you wonder what are you then creating by doing that? You know, there's always a downstream effect from everything we do. Thank you all very much. Thank you.